I need everybody to stand up here, and if, you know, physically, if you can't do it, it's okay. Just hang with me here. Stand on up there, okay? You guys can do this. So here's what we're going to do. We're just going to have a little bit of fun this morning, just a little bit, don't worry. Um, But we're just going to loosen up for the sermon, okay, because I'm going to work you all today. So just uh, feel that stretch there, okay? Next arm, come on, you guys can do this. Out. I'm gonna call you out if I see you not doing it, okay? I'm not kidding. Um, okay, how about your triceps? Oh, that feels good, loosening up that tricep. Okay, um, I see somebody not doing these. Lucky I don't know your name over there. Um, okay, um, there we go. Now just put your hands behind your back. Oh, doesn't that feel good, okay? Now, uh, let's do this, just slide your right arm down, stretch your side here, come on now. You guys can do this. Uh Uh-oh, somebody pulled a muscle. Uh, Look, we've got some emergency workers in the back. Uh, Other side, now, okay, we're gonna just go a little harder here, so just put your hands on the pew in front of you if you need to, and just kinda squat down on one foot, feel. You know, feel your muscles engaging, okay? So if you're a guest here, don't worry, we don't do this every Sunday. Um, <clears throat> now do your next leg, okay? And now here's what we're gonna do, or here's what we were gonna do. I marked out a little course in our parking lot. <laughs> Y'all, I'm not kidding. Point three three miles. So three laps, you're gonna get one mile. We were going to have a not-so-fun run today, okay? A a not-so-fun run just to get you warmed up for the service. And and, um, I was going to say, if you get lapped, it's okay, then you can just come in. But I've been asked by our facilities team to not do this because you'd get the carpet really wet and you'd get your pews wet. So fortunately, this hour, now before you act so happy, I had a donor who said $1,000 for first place. 500 for second and 250 for third. So anyway, you can just sit down in this hour. We don't know about next hour though, okay? Now, I am looking out at some of my friends here that are a little more competitive than others. I'm actually looking at one friend that I know on Strength Finders competition is his number one strength. I will not call him out. But you know, if, if today, we didn't get rained out, and you were gonna do this fun run, some of you would have been a little frustrated with me, right? Neil, I didn't get to prepare. I don't have the right clothes on. And some of you would have said, if I had known we were gonna do a race today, I wouldn't have worked out so hard yesterday. Yes, there are people like that, y'all. Some of you would have said, man, last week I would have been doing some speed exercise, some speed work, you know, so I could win this thing. And some of you would have said, man, if I'd known three months ago, I could have gotten ready. You've been saying that forever about things, right? For sure, lots of people would have been really frustrated And as some people were walking out to race, a lot of people would have just thrown up their hands and said, oh, I have no chance of winning the $1,000, forget it. Church, I want to remind us how often the Bible actually talks about the Christian life as a kind of race we are running. And how often Your Bible says, guys, don't just throw up your hands and say it's not worth it. And and how often the Bible talks about generations of Christians like ours where there's just really difficult things going on, whether it's distractions to our faith or whether there's deceptions about our faith or whether there's distortions about our faith and how the Bible says, listen, You stay in the race. I want you to turn this morning with me to a, probably a one page letter in your Bible. It's called the letter of Jude. I want you to turn there. We're gonna do two weeks on this here. If you can get to the book of Revelation, the last book of your Bible, you can find Jude by just going back one page If you don't have a Bible, you can use the Bible in the pew in front of you, and I think it's page 964, 
We're going to look at the book of Jude. And I want you to know that Jude is writing to a group of people, believers. And, and there's this distractions to their faith, distortions to their faith, um, deceptions about their faith is causing divisions in the church. And what's really scary about this deal Jude is talking about, it's not just something that's coming from the outside, it's coming from the inside. And, and Jude's message that I wanna talk about over the next two weeks is this. You strengthen yourselves to contend for the faith by doing what I'm gonna call faith-specific exercises, got it? You strengthen yourselves, you don't just throw up your hands and say, oh man, I'm so confused, I don't know what else to do. You strengthen yourselves to contend for the faith by doing faith-specific exercises, and here's what I'm gonna do today, we're just gonna look at this idea of contending for the faith, and then I'm gonna talk about doing faith-specific exercises. And actually, Jude gives four of them. We're gonna take two today, two next week. But let's start with this idea of contending for the faith, oh, th this command, and why God is commanding it to those believers, and why I think it's so relevant for us today, okay? So let's just start off verse one, where Jude who we really believe he was a half-brother of Jesus because what he tells here when he says he's Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ, and a brother of James. Now, I want you to see how he addresses people here. To those who are three things, called, beloved in God the Father, kept for Christ Jesus. Called, loved by God the Father, and kept for Christ Jesus. So Richard, you understand, Richard, this morning, that you are actually not just here by some accident of your own choosing, but you've been called by God. God loves you and he's keeping you for this great gift to Jesus himself. The same is true for you, Dolores. Amen, sister. The same is true for you, Michelle and Kay and Larry and every single person here, you are called by God. Loved by God the Father. You are being kept as this precious gift to Jesus. And let me tell you why I tell you that. Because Jude, please, when you hear some harsh things Jude has to say about those who are coming in and creating distortions, distractions, deceptions that lead to divisions. This is not the angry prophet getting on his people. No, this is a guy who's saying, listen, we're starting here from a place of security. You know, when people run races or even when they're preparing to maybe contend for a job or a, a position somewhere. We know that when we're feeling insecure, there's a lot, a lot of wasted energy, right? Not you. You're called and loved and kept. And so out of that, Jude prays in verse two, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. And he's really praying, church, expecting, yes, you guys, not only can you run the race, I expect that God wants to give you the fuel necessary so that you might succeed. Verse three, beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, let me, let me say something about our common salvation. We are people who believe that God sent his son Jesus. He was the God man. For, for a world that had fallen, God created this beautiful creation. He sent in place a redemption plan through Jesus that he is um, working and that he wants every single person here this morning to believe this. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. He died on a cross and he rose again. And all who believe in him have life forever with him. That's what we are hoping 
And, that, and, and Jude says, I just wanted to talk about how beautiful, how awesome that is, that anybody here can come to God, not based on your moral performance, but based on what he, Jesus has done for you. But he says this, I found it necessary, if you continue in the verse, he says, I found it necessary to do something else, to write appealing to you. Yo, the word appealing there is a super interesting word. It's the same word we get the word Holy Spirit from. It's the word that means this, to come alongside. Y'all hear me say, Jude is not simply the angry prophet here. He's like a coach who comes alongside and says, you know what, I know, I know that you can do this. God loves you. God has called you. You're kept for Christ Jesus. He says, I write appealing to you to contend for the faith. Now, y'all, if you're still not clear why I'm dressed how I am normally dressed, somebody said, Neil, you have a really nice outfit on today. I said, oh, Sunday morning is my normal outfit, whatever you normally see me on Sunday morning. This is how I just wanna dress when I'm at home during the week. But I want you to know why I have this normal outfit on today, the word content. That word over and over again is used for the word athlete, engaging in an athletic competition, fighting a battle. It's the person who says, I'm gonna jump in the fray even if it's a little rainy outside, I'm not gonna let it keep me from getting out there. That's the word. And I really do church when we think about what we're, gonna, we're talking about here the next two weeks, I want you to think about it this way. God has called every one of us to go out there. And he says, contend for the faith. Now I wanna say something here. You notice the text says this. For the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. I wanna ask you, how did you receive your faith? It was delivered to you. Church, it was not something, when we talk about the true faith, as he's gonna say later, the most holy faith, please hear this. When we talk about the faith, we're not talking about something you discover in and of yourself. You know why I have to say that, right? Because we live in a culture right now that says all of these things that are happening is you just need to discover what's right for you, right? And, and so here, here's, here's why I wanted to pick Jude to talk a couple weeks about Jude because we live in a culture right now where lots of believers that I know are really wrestling with, gosh, Neil, I just, I don't know what to make of all these questions wrapped around sexual identity. And it doesn't seem to match up with what the Bible has to say, and it seems like people are really feeling certain things, or, or, or even about an election coming up that we've talked about. And how do we, how do we keep holding on to this idea that you, if you believed in Jesus, you are primarily your first allegiance, your foremost allegiance, you are a citizen of heaven. And you do all with that in mind, and how do I live that out in a real world, in the real country I live in, in the real state that I live in, in the real city and neighborhood I live in? Or, or more and more, I, I hear people talking, believers in Jesus. You know, I wonder, Is this thing about Jesus the only way really true? I, I mean, there's so many people in our country right now of, of different faith preferences. And, and what I want you to hear, church, is that if you're a believer in Jesus and, and, and you have a Bible, you understand that you're not simply discovering what is true about you, the world, and God in and of yourself, you actually have an authority outside of yourself. And it's really hard because so often it's not according to our intuition. And, and, and 
and that the things you might feel really, really strongly about, you've got to say, do, do I believe this faith that was delivered from Jesus to the apostles to us? Am I going to wrestle with that? Okay? Now, Jude is going to go into their particular situation, their particular distractions, distortions, deceptions that are creating division. If you go to verse four, here's what he says. Certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. They are ungodly people, so this is kind of hard. Jude says, these people that I'm talking about, they are under a condemnation, and here's two things they are described as doing. They pervert or turn or twist the grace of God into sensuality, and they deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ, and those two things go together. He's saying, they say, whatever arises in your own heart, especially when it comes to moral issues, you just decide whatever is good for you. And he says, and you know what comes with that? They're actually denying an authority above themselves, Jesus. And, and I said a couple weeks ago, you know, we live in a world where people say, love to say this. You know, I really don't like the church, and I don't like, really like Christians, but Jesus seems pretty cool to me, and I think I'd really like Jesus. <laughs> and, and again, I would say to us, when, when we talk about this, are we saying, listen, I'm for whatever this Bible says, and I'm going to bring myself under the authority of all who Jesus is, all that Jesus says, and all that Jesus stands for. And you know, even as I was preparing this, I thought, some people are gonna say this. Man, are we really making too big of a deal out of things here? And what Jude's gonna do in verses five through 15 about the people in that day, he's gonna let you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, it's actually a really big deal to God. And he gives two sets of three divine judgments, and to those he adds a bunch of little extras, so you get about 12 mentions of the judgment of God. I just wanna look at two of these today so we see how important it is for us to contend for the faith, to get out there and run the race, even if it's a little rainy at times, okay? Look at verse six. No, let's go to five. Jude says, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Y'all, this is a reference to the time when the nation of Israel, God frees them from Egypt. He's taking them to the promised land, and they are on the cusp of winning their prize. And two spies are sent into, uh, 12 spies are sent into the land to come back, Joshua and Caleb, and say, let's go for it, we can win this thing. The prize money is ours, the land. And 10 say, there's giants in the land. Oh, it's raining out. I'm not dressed properly. And the whole, the whole nation starts whining and says, we can't do this, this is ridiculous. And, and you know what they do? They pick up stones to stone Moses, and then they say, it would have been better that we had died in Egypt. It would have been better if we would just die in the wilderness right now. And, and before we're too hard on those people, you know, they're just doing what, what we do today. They really are. They're just saying, you know, this is so counterintuitive. God's saying, go fight this battle. We're not prepared. We didn't dress for it. It's raining out. All, all these kinds of things. This just doesn't make sense to us. And the, whole, uh, the rest of the world looks so different from what God is saying. Why would we do that? And it says, very hard thing here. Afterward, destroyed those who did not believe. That was the judgment. Y'all, and before we're too hard on this, 
on God here saying, man, God was kind of rough on them. I want you to understand, this is how God's judgment came at that time, and it's how it often comes. God gave them what they asked for. God just gave them what they asked for. <sighs> Might as well just die in the wilderness. Okay, and a whole generation of people died. Does it matter to God? Of people that are distracting, distorting, deceiving people about the faith because they've said, we'll do whatever we wanna do and we're gonna be our own bosses. Apparently, it really matters to God. I'm gonna show you one more. Just so when you read the book of Jude, you can kind of make sense of what's going on. Verse six, it says this, the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Now, what is that about? Well, we know in Genesis chapter six, there was these super beings, I'm gonna call them. Angels, superhumans, and they came down out, of the, out from under the authority of God and they had sex with human women. And they created this super, super human beings. One of their commentaries that they had of the day said this. Those were angels who rejected the authority of God and said they were gonna do whatever they wanted when it came to morality. And God is judging them. And Jude is just telling you that so that you would know, Christian, how we live our lives matters. And what we believe should affect how we live out there, right? That's, he's wanting to make this really, really clear. Jude says to a group of people, y'all, you contend for the faith. And, and I want you to know, this is something, I, I was driving over here and I thought about this this morning, that I never felt like I had to say this 10 years ago, but I, I'm gonna, I, I feel like I have to say it all the time now. What I'm saying here today is for believers in Jesus. It is not for those out there, okay? This is for believers in Jesus. And, and, and one of the things that Jude is not saying is, now get up and go fight everybody when he says contend for the faith. He's talking about you running the race God has given you, and you know how you start? This brings me to my second point. You start right here in your own heart. Strengthen yourselves by doing what I'm gonna call faith-specific exercises. Now, let me tell you why I use this term, faith-specific exercises. There's a physical therapist that I've followed in the past, and she's really big on runners doing running-specific exercises. You see, if you knew three months earlier that we were gonna have this one mile not so fun run today. If you'd known that three months earlier, you might not have said, okay, every day I'm just gonna do as many push-ups as I can do so that I can win the race. Unless you think, we're thinking I'm just gonna push everybody over and that's how I'm gonna win. Um, you might have done some what? You might have done some lunges, right? You, you might have done some um, deadlifts and you, you might have done some speed work, running specific exercises. Jude actually gives you four faith-specific exercises. He says this, he says, listen, you build yourselves up in your most holy faith. He says, secondly, you pray in the Holy Spirit. He says, keep yourself in the love of God and you wait for your future with Jesus, build, pray, keep, and wait. Now, I wanna tell y'all, we're gonna take two today, and we're gonna take two next week, but I want you to see it there in verse 20, where Jude says, build yourself up in the faith, beloved, building yourselves up in your, can I just show it again, most holy faith? And he uses this image of building. Now, church, every strengthening, and I want you to hear this because I really want to challenge us this morning. Every strengthening for every endeavor requires building some kind of base, amen? 
Yo, in another life, I was an electrical engineer. I, 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 long before I ever took an electrical engineering class, I was building a base. I did lots of math. I took a lot of math classes, building a base to walk into doing some electrical engineering classes. M music. Our daughter Natalie, before she ever played in an orchestra, when she was just a, a little kid, was building a bass, learning how to read music, learning music theory, right? Before she ever played in an orchestra. And, and if, you know, you're a runner or a triathlete or a cyclist, you know you're building a bass to ultimately, hopefully, get stronger and faster in doing what you're doing. Church, why should we expect that this faith that has been handed down to us would take anything less, okay? So you build yourselves up in your most holy faith. Now, I wanna give us something really specific to work on this week that we're gonna actually do this week as a group, okay? I wanna invite you to go to our website this week. You go to northwestbible.org, believe, okay? You go to the what we, what we Believe page, and here's what you're gonna see. It's gonna come up. Uh, I got a little video here, What We Believe, and you'll see our mission statement. You'll see our value use. You see some questions that we use to talk about our faith. There's even a little video about our messy cross here that you can understand more about the cross, our vision. And then finally, we have what we call our doctrinal statement. The basics of the faith that we believe in. And there's 12 points, and there's just a couple verses under each. And here's what I want to encourage all of us to do. That you would just take two each day, you would read the statement, you would think about it, and you would read the verses under it. And before you say, man, Neil, you give a lot of homework on Sunday mornings. Because I know y'all are already getting up every morning and saying the Beatitudes, right? You've been doing that? Okay, raise your hand, yeah. Um, uh, and, and you know what, but y'all, that's only taking you 30 seconds, right? And, and let, me, let me just say this when we think, whoa, this is, feels like I got a lot of things going on. Here's what you do. You just, you just take 10 minutes to do this before you binge watch your series on Netflix or you burn 35 minutes on Instagram, right? Watching meaningless videos. Because any strengthening, you know, requires some consistency and some stretching. And maybe that's part of the lie that our culture is telling us when it says, you just do what feels good and what you're discovering in your own heart rather than taking something outside of you and building and working with that and growing and being comfortable with that. Now, some of you are like, Neil, that's no stretch at all for me. Well, I got something for you too today. There's a little series called Exploring Christian Theology. This was written by Michael Spiegel, who my wife had in, when she was in seminary, and by Nathan Holstein, who actually sat next to me when I was at LSU in electrical engineering. This guy's really smart. Um, and, and they've written something for not seminary students, but for people in the pew. And what you could do is, if you're really serious about strengthening your faith, you could um, get these and you could just, when you look at our doctrinal statement, you could just find the spot in this book. Now, I'm gonna tell you why I'm telling you this today, y'all, why I'm pressing us on this. You know that there was a time when, when people trained people to spot counterfeit dollar bills. What did they do? They just made them look at the real thing over and 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 over again. Y'all, I can't even keep up with all the issues going on in our culture today. I mean, people come up to me, Neil, what do you think about this? I'm like, whoa, I'm still back on, you know, number one, two, three, four, five, and six, okay? 
But you know what all of us can do is build yourself up in your most holy faith, just studying the real thing, okay? Secondly, and I'm gonna put these two together here, so hang with me. Notice he says in verse 20, here's your second faith-specific exercise. He says, pray in the Holy Spirit. Now, I wanna talk about what this is, what it isn't, and I wanna show you a passage that's very similar to this. In Ephesians chapter six, Paul says this, praying at all times in the Spirit. Now, church, when we say praying at all times in the Spirit, I want you to understand why I point that out is that this is how all prayer is done. This is not just for special people who have a special form of prayer. And form is important, right? Because if you go to the physical therapist or a trainer to do your uh, running specific exercises, they're gonna say, hey, when you do those deadlifts, let's get some good form going here, okay? Our form is important here, and we pray at all times in the Spirit. So what is that? What does it look like? Why do we say that? I wanna show you a slide here about your whole Christian life. Ephesians, we're to, or Galatians, we're told to walk by the Spirit. In Romans, when it, you're, it talks about how do you deal with the temptations in your life, the sin in your life, it says put to death the deeds of the body by what? The Spirit, right? In, in 1 Corinthians 12, it says really people say Jesus is Lord by the Spirit. When you come to worship here, when you worship privately through your whole life, Philippians 3.3, 3, that the true believers, they worship by the Spirit. I'm showing you this because I don't talk about this enough, that our whole Christian life is guided and motivated by the Spirit. Got it? That, that, that when we talk about desperate dependence on Jesus, we understand that the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, comes and lives in you, and that we're motivated and guided by the Spirit. It's the whole of the Christian life. And so, when we talk about prayer, what are we saying? Maybe it's this, two things here. Motivated by the Spirit, when you pray. Anybody here ever wonder how how should I even pray? Anybody here ever not very motivated to pray? Praying in the Spirit. Holy Spirit, help me right now to pray for my family, to pray for my children, to to pray for my church. Holy Spirit, help me to pray for how I'm gonna interact. Holy Spirit, help me to pray for my non-believing friends. Holy Spirit, motivate me to pray because I put on my um, to-do list this week several times to pray and I actually didn't do it. That's me. Motivate it and guide it by the Spirit. I wanna show you something here when we go. I wanna go back to our um, We Believe page, and I want, you to see, I want you to see this first one. Church, wanna know what we believe about this book? We believe the Bible to be verbally inspired word of God without error in the original writings, and the supreme and final authority in doctrine and the practice of our lives. And so this Tomorrow, you're gonna read 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, which says this, all of scripture is inspired by God or breathed out by God. Peter says it this way, there's no prophecy of scripture that was given without the Holy Spirit's working. (laughs) All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the person of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. So when I say motivated and guided by the Spirit, I want you to, all know, almost always, when I pray, I have my Bible out. The Holy Spirit guided this, revealed the will of God through this Bible. So part of how you pray, motivate it, help me Holy Spirit, guide it by the Spirit is you just pray what is revealed to you in Scripture. So this week, here's how they connect. Tomorrow, when you read that doctrinal statement, when you read 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and then you think about it, and then you say this, you just pray. 
God, help me to see that this Bible is your word. Help me to trust in this Bible as your word. Because all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching. And God, right now, through the work of your spirit, I pray that you would teach me what I need to learn. For correction, Holy Spirit, search me and see if there's any hurtful way in me, as the psalmist wrote. Um, Help me to see where correction is necessary in my life. That the person of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work to go out there and run the race. God, help me say yes to you in every way that I can. Help me say yes to your word by by the work of the Holy Spirit so that I might be all that you want me to be as your called person, as your loved person, as your prize to Jesus. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Got it? Know what we're doing this week? Church? So, when one of those things that just kind of freaks you out about what's happening in our culture comes your way this week, I just want you to think about this. Strengthen yourself to contend for the faith by doing faith-specific exercises.